Good morning, everybody. Today, we will discuss the Lord Buddha and his path to Nirvana. Today also is the thrice blessed day which is happening in Asia, we will have it tomorrow. That's the full moon day. Swami Vivekananda says, he was the greatest man that I was ever born. The greatest soul power that was ever manifest. As the old prayer goes, Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dharmam Sharanam Gachami, Sangam Sharanam Gachami. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha, the order of Buddhism. This prayer has been recited for the last 2,500 years or more by billions and billions of people. And it is indeed a very auspicious and a holy day for all humanity. Because the questions of existence were solved by this great person. Sri Ramakrishna says, well, he was an incarnation of God. As he was great, so his teachings are great. So we have a authentication by Sri Ramakrishna himself. Now, Swami Vivekananda, in all his works, you find a tremendous reverence for this person. He's saying that he was a fulfillment of all religions. He was a working Jnani, that is a person of knowledge who made practical his knowledge of his attainments down to the commonest persons. And he spoke in a language that was understandable to everybody. He did not, he deliberately did not speak in that ancient Sanskrit saying, my message is the message for the masses. Each life, our lives is, are unique. We go to so much of toil and suffering and travails and miseries. But this story of our lives is embedded in a larger cultural context. And this is also embedded in a larger civilizational or racial context. And that again is embedded in the matrix of humanity, the whole of humanity. Our stories get lost, as it were, in the huge pool of stories. 
but there comes a time in the history of humanity a story that is so powerful though it is within that person and within the cultural matrix and within civilizational and within humanity it changes the entire civilizational cultural and human story and it becomes moreover it becomes our story finally our lives find a kind of resonance with the entirety and today we are going to discuss something about this great story which in a way is our story he was my hero since i was young i loved and so even if i get emotional you will got to excuse me it the story starts way back 568 before common era now this is called the axial age which lasted from 600 to 300 before common era and it was in this axial age where the philosophical or theological foundations of humanity were laid down and humanity just developed there was a spontaneous you can say rising of different prophets sages and saints during this time whether you look at in greece or in the middle east or in china anywhere especially in india this was the age and buddha was born during this age now in the northern parts of india there is a small river on two sides of the river they live two clans they were vassals of a greater kingdom down on the plains called the koshala the vassals were one was the shakya which buddha was born into and the other was the koliya and they had a kind of alliance they used to marry to keep everything going on so it was during this time it was more like these clans were oligarchs i mean <laughs> because this word has become kind of uh, in famous nowadays because of various reasons but uh, these kings as they say they ruled a small kingdom buddha's father was shuddhodhana one whose food is pure and he had married two sisters from the koliya clan buddha's mother was maha you can say maya and her sister was maha prajapati when buddha was born well his mother had a kind of a dream one day one night she saw a white elephant holding in his trunk a lotus and it placed the lotus within her and then entered into her and she was full of peace and bliss the next morning she told the king this is the dream i saw and as usual in those days astrologers and sages were called to interpret that dream and there was a unanimous you can say decision there that this child who is going to be born will be a great person and the king was so pleased happy oh my god no all kings they want to look for their successors and so when the time came to deliver the child 
as it was usual, the woman goes to her father's house. As she was traveling to Ramaga, that is, she was trying to cross the river, but there was a sacred grove, now it's called sacred grove, called Lumbini. And as they were resting there with the entourage, Buddha was born. They returned to the kingdom of Kapilavastu, which is now in present day Nepal. And all the kings, ministers, and everybody, and they were so amazed that all the auspicious signs enumerated in the scriptures were visible in the child. That was an old Indian way of uh, understanding the future by looking at the physical signs on the body. And, and everybody declared, yes, you're going to be a great, great emperor. One week after his birth, sage called Asita, he comes and he is weeping and weeping and then the king was alarmed. Why were you weeping? He said, I am weeping because I will not be able to see the future glory that this child will bring to the world. He will rule people's hearts. He will change people's consciousness. And as he says, his will not be an empire of the earth. His will be the empire of the hearts of humanity. He will be a monk. And the king was even more alarmed. Oh, after all this, then he will penetrate the mysteries of the universe and give it away to the people. But his alarm and terror were kind of, had become secondary because Buddha's mother, she passed away the next day. And the whole kingdom, instead of celebrating, was now mourning. So this was the first blessed day, the day he was born. He was born on that day. He attained enlightenment on that same day. And he attained the final release also on that same day. That's the reason why it's called the thrice blessed day. He was brought up in relative luxury, but he was trained to be a king in athletics, and sports and skill, military skills and administration. He was trained to be like that. At 16, he married a beautiful saying girl of again the neighboring clan, Kolia clan called Yashodara. And she was his equal in everything. She used to go around to the underprivileged people, care for them, look after their comforts, and she was highly philosophical. They had a son called Rahula, and as the old story goes, the king had shielded him from all the miseries of the world, because the other prediction was if, if Buddha, this, this child, would go out and see and get in touch with the miseries of the world, he will not live in this world anymore. And since they belong to the old uh, lineage of the sage Gautama, he was called Gautama. His given name was Siddhartha, one who has attained the end, this goal. So Siddhartha Gautama, he was also called the, the lion of the Shakya clan. 
he was also called the sage of the Shakya clan, Shakya Muni, Shakya Singh. He was excellent in everything he did, loving and obedient and caring. And one day when he was out, he insisted on being taken out of the palace and its grounds and from the protective environment. He went out to the city and he saw first a sick man tottering on his staff. Then he saw an old person abandoned. And then he's asking his charioteer, what is this? Well, that's the, that's what everyone will go through. And he was shocked. He was young. This? It ends like this, being uncared for, sick and feeble, yes. And then they proceeded further and they found, he saw some people carrying a corpse to the cremation grounds, a dead person. And that, Chanda, what's this? This is the goal of all beings that are born and that kind of blew him away. If this is what's going to happen, is there a way that we can escape this? And these thoughts kept on bubbling in his mind over and over and over. He used to discuss this with his wife, Yashodara. One day, and his wife, she also had dreams three times that Buddha, her husband, will leave the kingdom and me, his son, and everything royal and leave and become a monk. And she actually encouraged him in his, how noble these people were, unimaginable. Today, if the son wants to go somewhere out to another city and 20 people will say, don't go there, come stay away. To seek this and then, you know that it's dramatized how he, when he was, he had decided to leave, his wife had made all arrangements, kept his riding clothes and his horse ready. And she was awake, pretending to be asleep. He enters the room. It was again that same bright moonlight. The light filtered through the windows and he saw her and he saw his son one last time and he left. Well, he left to seek answers, not just for himself. But for the world, Swami Vivekananda says, he did everything for others. None of his actions were for the self. So he leaves and that is again another great story. So inspiring. But then let's cut down to the basics. He goes to a teacher called Alarama. And he learns yoga. But even before this, there, there's one incident in his life when he was about eight or nine years old. There was always a, a, kind of a sowing festival. Like there's a house festival, there's a sowing festival where uh, the king first takes the plow. In the old days, you know, had the bullocks and then they, they, they used to, uh, you know, you had a plow. And the king held the first plow and then he plowed the fields and that was a huge festival and everybody was kind of in merriment and it was like a picnic and they then they searched where's the boy where's he gone they found him sitting under a tree deep in meditation so
so yoga was not new to him for obvious reasons these people were born like this and then they woke him out from that deep meditation and they brought him out here and and they were surprised at the depth of his meditation so here we have a first glimmer of his future life so at at the sage uh, alarama kalamas you can say yoga institute he was training hundreds of people in yoga that was the age also where yoga the teachings of yoga the philosophy of yoga and the practices of yoga were prevalent everywhere so he learned the yoga he practiced them and in 3 days he attained those high states and the teacher was mighty pleased he taught him higher forms of yoga which he also accomplished within a month and then he said is that all yes this is my, the limit of my knowledge, yoga knowledge and then but the leaves that hermitage and then for the next 6 years of his life he practiced the most severe austerities he goes to different teachers discards them as inadequate and then falls back on his own efforts so they say that he had reduced his food to just one grain of rice every day and he was weak and one day he kind of he fainted while he was meditating and the story goes that there was a young girl who was going to offer some of this rice porridge to some of these forest you can see deities and she sees a monk lying down like that fainted she offers him that porridge her name was sujata forever enshrined now in our memories he ate that porridge fortified then he renewed his efforts in understanding the mystery of existence and with that great wow i'll quote in I'll quote it in sanskrit and then i'll translate it yasane shushyatu me shariram tvagasti mansam pralayan sriyatu aprapya bodhim bahu kalpa durlabam naivasanat kaya matashalapyate he says hey yasane let my body dry on this seat may my bones and flesh at all wither away i don't care i am not going to move from this seat till i attain that supreme knowledge that supreme enlightenment which is difficult to come in many cycles of creation nowadays people say oh let let's go to some yoga institute and after one month they, they do some hopping about and say we have in many cycles of creation it is difficult to aprapya bodhim bahu kalpa durlabham amazing so this is that great resolve i am not going to move from here till i attain this enlightenment and as the saying goes he sat down under that bow tree the bodhi tree and there he became the light of asia as i say as edwin anul titled his life of the buddha so he attained enlightenment but before he attained enlightenment that second blessed day had to dawn so as he was sitting down i remember sitting down under that same tree the descendant of that same tree in bodhgaya and i was so thrilled saying all my dreams have come true and i hope i get enlightenment here and now like the buddha but that's another story for another time <laughs> and it was as he sat down there with the resolve 
it was night. And before the yogi attains enlightenment, he has, he or she has to conquer the entire phenomenal world made out of the subtle materials. And this has been kind of, yeah, put in a story form that there was the great tempter called Mara and he had five daughters. As Buddha was sitting down, the first daughter comes. She is space, kind of personalized as a daughter. So space appears and then she just merges into space, a form merges. The space curls, expands, contracts and huge sounds are heard, reverberating the entire world. Buddha kept silent, is something called a vipassana, clear sight. He could see through the illusion, so he was unmoved. Space brought all his terrors, all, all these black holes and white holes or whatever there are. She couldn't succeed. She reappeared and walks away in a huff. Then the next girl steps in and she is wind. And there was a tremendous wind blowing, lifting trees, hurling rocks and smashing things. And there was a huge kind of storm that had arisen. And she is throwing stones and boulders and all around Buddha. They are not touching him. Uprooting trees and hills and mountains and everything. There was debris all around. Buddha kept silent looking at that phenomena. She couldn't succeed. She departs with a huff. Next comes water and she lashes the whole oceans into waves and brings them surging right to the edge where Buddha is sitting down and she brings this huge kind of water and it's, she drenches everything and everything is flooded. Buddha is again still and calm, he's not moved, she also fails, she walks in a huff, then comes fire, she burns everything and the, fire, the conflagrations reach right up to where Buddha is sitting down. The whole forest where he is sitting down is a blaze, the whole world is a blaze. Again he is silent, can see through these illusions. She again leaves. Then comes earth and she comes along with earthquakes and all the volcanoes and she's spewing out, you can say, all the things in the earth. Lava is flowing around Buddha and there's earthquakes and all the noises that earth can figure out. Yet. Buddha is sit, sitting silent and still. When these had left, they say, there was calm. Buddha, with his clear sight, saw through all these things. There was a pool of water just near his seat. So he was reaching out to touch the earth, to be the witness that he had conquered these elements of nature. And as he was trying to touch it, somebody grabbed his forearm. He pulled, pulled back his arm and then he sees a replica of himself sitting facing him. 
they are both looking at each other. And it went on for a long time. That was another amazing dialogue. So, the first figure that belongs to Buddha, he is looking at an exact replica of himself sitting in front. So, that replica or the mirror image says, you go where no one else has gone. Will you take me along? And Buddha says, finally, I have met you. You will not build this house again, that is this body again. The illusion says, but I am you, I am your home, you live in me. Buddha says, oh my God of the false self, you are pure illusion. You do not exist. And the illusion was terrified because it was detected. And then Buddha banishes the illusion with his clear sight. But before departing, there is a loud wail. as if the whole world of illusions was wailing that it had been detected. Its secrets have been unearthed as it were. And in the place of the illusion sat Mara, the, the god of illusion, sitting naked and weeping. And Buddha felt compassion and he says, go and Mara vanishes. At this point, the whole earth celebrates because Buddha at that point ent enters Nirvana, attains enlightenment. So, Gautama Siddhartha became the Buddha year at this point, the awakened one, the enlightened one. This is the second blessed day. For the next many years, he lived till about 80, he went about preaching the doctrine of liberation to people in simple terms. There is pain, there is misery or there is sorrow, the kamasti. There is a way out of pain. There is a cause for pain and there is liberation from pain. So, and he gave the, then the eightfold path to Nirvana, you know, right living, right speech, right meditation, right livelihood, everything right, 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 right. Yeah, that was wonderful. This story in life, it has been kind of elaborated. It has captured the imagination of people, a prince who renounced everything in search for the answers of existence, he got them and then he conferred that knowledge to the world. So he lived and that is another tale for another time. There are so many stories there in his active preaching life. It's amazing. Saying 
there was no heart that was, that was so loving and so compassionate. He was willing to sacrifice himself even for a sacrificial animal. His love went out to the lowest of, we can say, species of living beings. Later on, we know that the great king Ashoka, and he is considered now the greatest emperor that was ever born and ever ruled. He molded his kingdom on the teachings of the Buddha. He was the emperor Ashoka. And historians say that he was greater than all Caesars. And all that. We are kind of fixated on blood and gore and killing and all that. This great emperor, basing his life and philosophy and his kingdom on the teachings of the Buddha, flourished. So, Buddha's teachings were expanded right down from Antioch in the west till Japan. It changed Asia. Buddha's, the monks there, were the first missionaries. They went without the sword and fire, without coercing anyone, just with their realizations and their moral strength, they changed the whole of Asia. They changed the story of Asia. So here we have Buddha going around preaching in the language of the people. They say that it was Magadhi, there was an ancient dialect which was, there was a huge big kingdom down there. He lived there and he traveled there and he preached the salvation to everybody. Everyone was eligible for this. He denounced all the gods. And yet we made him into a god. He denounced all ritualism as useless. And that's the reason why his religion, the religion he founded, is so popular. Because it throws the entire responsibility on yourself. Don't blame any god, don't blame any man, don't blame anyone for what you are going through. Rise up, be a hero and come out of it. Conquer yourself. This was the doctrine of salvation, of liberation, of nirvana that he preached. And when the time had come for him to depart, a disciple of his was named Chanda. He had offered him food as monks they depend on people for their food. That's an old tradition. We also do that, but now it's kind of modified in a way. So he gave him mushrooms, which were not edible. They are poison, the poisonous variety. And when he ate it, he understood the poisonous food. And he tells all his disciples, I have eaten it, you don't eat any of this. And the disciple is distraught. What did I do? He said, no, you are helping me to leave now. So in that great posture, he lay down and you know, rested his head on his left arm. And that is, uh, the statues are all over the place. And then, as if the whole earth was mourning, the trees and the flowers drooped. There was gloom all over. There was silence, as if the whole world was now weeping and weeping and weeping. So he lay down in the forest of sal trees. That is another holy place. 
and his disciple, his principal disciples called Ananda. He was, he served the Buddha for many, many years. He was weeping. What? You weeping at this point of time? I asked you to be strong, not to be weeping like this. And then his, he's saying aphoristic words, Atma Deepo Bhava, be a light unto yourself. No weakness. Don't show any weakness. Don't have any weakness. Stand up on your own strength. Stand in your own strength. Be a light unto yourself. And he gave up his body. So, his first attainment of nirvana was followed by when he gave, finally gave up this called a pari nirvana, maha pari nirvana, the complete. So, what it is an extinguishing of individual existence. Oh, yeah, the individual existence is extinguished into universal existence. As you say, when he was learning yoga, he had attained the state of wondrous serenity. He was serene. And then as his meditation had deepened and deepened, it became serene. He was established in the mind of limitless space, limitless consciousness, where his consciousness was embedded in all of creation. So he had attained that state. This is nirvana. Individual existence is gone. We don't understand that. It, it is extinguished into the universal existence. It becomes one with the universe. That is nirvana. People close their eyes and say, I am nirvana. I have attained nirvana. What is that? Darkness, blankness? No. So this is nirvana. Then he attained what is called a great liberation, the Mahapari Nirvana. So, to speak about this itself is a blessing, to hear about is a blessing. This story, which started 568 years before Common Era. is a story being retold over and over and over again. It's, this is our story. We also, in a way, are trying to understand the mysteries of our own existence. Why are we here? What are we doing here? What is the meaning and purpose of all this? If everything ends in sickness, old age and death, is there something beyond us? These are the answers he found. These are the answers he gave all of us. Starts with, be a light unto yourself. And depend on your own self. So, when you look around, you see, we have a picture of the Buddha here. In all our centers, Vedanta centers, he is worshipped. And that, you know, Hinduism, they made him the ninth incarnation and they <laughs> solved all our problems. <laughs> Thus, Swami Vivekananda said, he towers above humanity. And that's what he, he towers. Today, we are looking out for what will future humanity be? Like me and you and a little stupid, a little silly. We don't bumbling about doing this. No, the future humanity is already here in the story of the Buddha. We are looking out for, you know, huge people with huge guns and f shooting and fighting and this and that. That's not humanity. 
all our movies and all our most of our movies uh, and all our literature soaked in this kind of violence and violence and bloodshed and hate and crime and corruption and evil that's de that's destructive so what is the future role model the future icon of humanity the statue of the buddha is the answer he is that is the icon calm still meditative wise enlightened compassionate loving this is the future humanity and for the last 2500 years about 2500 years we have not even been able to reach some of the lowest levels of this ideal that buddha had placed because he lived his message and we have been killing and fighting now you see this world we are in the middle of such violence such unnecessary violence wars and famines and crimes what's happening how can we still blunder we haven't learned our lessons yet and we have been given enough time we have killed in the name of religion we have made people homeless we have made widows and orphans in the name of religion and this was the teacher great teacher of religion discard all those old ghosts in your brains banish all your false illusions and you will attain that liberation i'll end up with swami vivekananda's quotation he loved the buddha saying when he was young he was medit he was a boy young he was meditating in his room and he had a vision of the buddha he emerged out of the wall and he saw the figure calm serene peaceful his eyes spoke just love and compassion he was dressed in monk's clothes like this and he carried the monk's water pot and the young vivekananda he was very young he got frightened and he got up from his seat and ran he left the room and then he said why am i running away he came back by the time the vision had disappeared and he said that day i was blessed with the vision of the lord buddha and towards the end he says i have a message for the west like buddha had a message for the east and his message is the message of ram krishna enough of all this running about grasping our illusions be like that create you can say buddha and conquer yourself you have to conquer yourself conquer your body conquer your mind conquer your senses conquer your mind and everything else and then you attain that blessed state of nirvana om peace 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 okay since buddha had appeared to swami vivekananda and swami ji couldn't could identify buddha as peace person how to reconcile his appearance on buddha to swami ji with the nirvana state of buddha does this appearance imply that buddha would retain his identity and personality yes yes this is a state where individual existence goes away as it was in nirvana but their subtle bodies keep on doing good to the world you and i when we attain nirvana 
will completely merge in the universality. Because our subtle bodies are too weak. These people, they come with a mission. And this has been the history of great incarnations and souls. That they do appear when it is required. And that's why you pray to them. Why do you pray otherwise to them? They are eternally. This is one of the mysteries of the doctrine of an incarnation, which in the future I would like to kind of take it you know, because a lot of misconceptions about what is an incarnation. How does God incarnate? Okay. So it 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 does happen. So you know my my guru when we asked him this kind of a similar question. So he says, well, it's a blessed contradiction. Let it be. 